Hello everyone, this is Andre from The Mental Health and I'm here with Professor Catherine Harmer from Oxford, who is the new president of the BAP. So congratulations, Catherine, president of the British Association for Psychopharmacology. How does that feel? Thank you. It's a huge honour and I'm really delighted to be a BAP president this year. And it's a particularly special year, of course, because it's the 50th anniversary year this year. So I'm humbled and delighted. What does BAP mean to you? It's been a part of your work life for many years, I guess. So I joined BAP actually 28 years ago. I added it up the other day and I couldn't quite believe it. So BAP has been really important to me through my whole career. I was a first year PhD student when I first uh, came here and it's brilliant support and uh, networking and education for early career researchers. And that's really carried on through every stage of my uh, career. And mm. it's just wonderful to be here with such a brilliant group of, of people, such friendly, supportive, witty, wise people. We've seen lots of people elected over recent months and lots of people who didn't get in and lots of yes. people who maybe are going to get in the next few weeks. So an exciting time for elections. And so this question gets asked a lot. What are you going to do? What's going to be different under your yes. kind of leadership? What, what have you got planned? What are your aims for this next yeah. term? Yeah. As I said, this is the BAP 50th year, so I really am standing on the shoulders of a giant. And uh, so partly I just want to keep up the really good work and traditions of the, the BAP and the, the formal work of, of everyone in the BAP office uh, that, that makes it is what it is. I think there, there are some things that are on my agenda in, in addition. There's one thing I think we do already, uh, but the importance of which I think is growing, and that is playing a role in demystifying de-dramatizing, reducing stigma about psychopharmacological treatments and making this a more public conversation. So there's a lot of information out there on, on social media and the, the news. So I imagine it can be a very confusing place when you're in a situation where you have to decide whether to take uh, an antidepressant or an antipsychotic. And um, I think the BAP has a really important role in providing really good quality information so that people can use that as part of their decision making and perhaps we need to do it in a, a proactive way and together with other organizations to really make that um, information available when people need it. So that is something I think will be increasingly important over the next two years. I'd also like to think about early career researchers a little bit more. A BAP does an, an awful lot for early career researchers. It has a lot of prizes, bursaries, education, training. But we know that phase, the, the PhD years and the early postdoc phase are a really stressful and tricky time in an academic's uh, career where the future funding, your contract, building up your CV, it all looms very large. And so we, what I'm really interested in is hearing from people what we could actually do more of to support that better. And I have some ideas. So, for example, we, we offer a preclinical certificate for training, which is a fantastic course for preclinical scientists, largely animal researchers. And then we have a lot of training for clinicians and uh, in the master classes and clinical certificates. But there's a growing membership of, of BAP who are perhaps in between those two uh, people working in human experimental medicine, uh, where perhaps uh, we could offer a little bit more. And so as part of this meeting, I'm going around trying to canvas opinions on whether that would actually be useful and important or if there's anything else that would be really useful to try and support that career development at that particularly stressful uh, time. Thank you. Excellent. I think it's really easy to become almost complacent about how amazing this is, this conference, which brings, you know, over 200 people together from all over the world presenting amazing science because it just happens year after year. But that in itself is a really fantastic thing that we need to protect. I couldn't agree more. I think the summer meeting is such a fantastic celebration of so many people's work. It brings people together. It brings the conversations together. You can hear in the coffee break and in the poster sessions, people are, are talking, they're exchanging ideas. It, it's such an important part of what BAP does to, to bring this, this group together in this, in this way in the summer meeting. And I also wanted to ask you a bit about your own work because you're presenting some work on ketamine and the antidepressant effects of ketamine and the kind of cognitive mechanisms around that. Yeah. So yeah, tell us a bit about that. Yes. So yes, we're speaking tomorrow morning with Sarah Costi. And basically what we were trying to do is to find out how uh, ketamine, which is a, a fast acting antidepressant, which works in treatment resistant depression, to try and find out how that might be working 
And this is really important because, as we know, uh, most antidepressants like SSRIs and other conventional treatments, they can take weeks or months before they have their effects. Whereas the uh, anaesthetic uh, ketamine, when given a, a sub-anaesthetic dose, is found to have effects that kick in within hours mm. and then are sustained for a number of days. And so if we knew how that was working, it would give us a lot of cl clues about how to devise better treatments and how they might be used best. And so what we've done is taken some uh, preclinical work, some work from animal models, which have shown interesting effects of ketamine, which may be involved in its mechanism of action. And then we've tried to see if these will translate to humans, whether those findings from the preclinical models hold true in, in, in humans. And to a large extent, they do. So we see some really nice effects on, for example, things like how we're remembering positive and negative information and how we're responding to aversive things that, that we test in an experimental paradigm, but we hope would translate to how you respond to aversive things in everyday life and particularly focusing on the response of this really small area above the thalamus called the herbenula. And the herbenula is really important for pain and aversive things and negative states. It puts a break on your pleasure, on your reward, if you like. It's mm -hmm. a kind of yin and yang of reward and processing. And we find that ketamine can reduce the response of that area even 24 hours after its administration. That, that's particularly been seen in animal models and now we can see it in, in humans as an, as an example. I guess it's really interesting when you think about mental health interventions. Historically, we haven't necessarily always known very much about how our treatments work. We've known that they do work, but it's the mechanisms and also that kind of back translation work, as you say. And I'm, I'm interested in what just looking at mental health science as a field, there's, there seems to be more interest in finding out how things are actually working now. And that yeah. seems to be getting funded more. Why yeah. is that happening? It's a good question. I suppose a lot of the treatments that we use in psychiatry were uh, initially discovered by chance, by serendipity. And so no one knew how they were working, but there was increasing interest in what, it, what is it that they're doing? I think why it's become so important right now is because we've actually got a lot more techniques mm. and methods that we can start to look at these questions in, in humans as well. Okay. Brilliant neuroimaging techniques. So for example, the herbenula that I was talking about is a really tiny area that would normally get missed in neuroimaging research, but with very high field MRI, you can actually see it and to look at the measurements of it. So that hasn't been possible until relatively recently. And I think that's gone hand in hand with a feeling that unless we understand how things are working, then we really don't have any hope of developing better treatments in the future. And I think everyone is aware that we need to keep on developing better treatments for the future. Fabulous, good luck. As president, good luck with the uh, presidential address at the uh, welcome dinner tomorrow night. I hope that goes well. I'm sure you'll get a rousing welcome from everyone. Thank you. Thank you for your time.